If there's one band rivalry that Oasis are famous for, it's their battle with Blur in the 1990s. But there is actually far more to the Oasis and Blur story than most people realise. So today, I want to tell from start to finish, I think for the first time, the complete story of Blur versus Oasis, the Battle of Britpop and beyond. Also including the long hidden reason that the whole thing started in the first place. The first time Oasis or Blur mentioned one another in the press happened way back in 1991. Noel Gallagher was a roadie for the Inspiral Carpets and a journalist from the now sadly defunct Select magazine had called them for an interview. None of the band were actually available, so the interviewer spoke to Noel, but the interview was never published until, in 1997, it appeared in this. Interviewer Stella Blackburn asked Noel in 1991, what do you think of the British music industry at the moment? Noel replied, current charts, Chesney Hawks, bag of shit, right? But Gary Clayle, In Spirals, Happy Mondays, Ride, Blur, and all them lot, it's good that they're all in the charts. Very, very, very healthy indeed. So, in the earliest days, Noel actually rated Blur alongside the Happy Mondays, Ride, and the band he himself worked for, the Inspiral Carpets. I think it's fair to say he held them in very high esteem. At this time, they had only released their debut album, Leisure, which went in at number seven. As time passed, Blur continued releasing albums, and Noel left the Inspiral Carpets and joined his younger brother Liam's band, Oasis. In 93, Oasis had been signed to Creation Records, and according to Oasis biographer Paolo Hewitt, the two bands first encountered each other in person in May 1994, just after the first Oasis single, Supersonic, had been released. Hewitt says this, the press were divided over Supersonic. NME's Keith Cameron made Supersonic single of the week. Peter Perfidis in The Melody Maker totally disagreed. He told his readers that the single sounded like Blur four years ago, a comment that would have seriously angered Liam. In mid-May, on a night out on the booze, Liam would get his chance to express his disgust when he and Noel met Blur's guitarist, Graham Coxon, at the Good Mixer pub in Camden. Much to his delight, he spotted Graham straight away and the brothers Gallagher went straight over to him. After roughly introducing themselves, they then started insulting his clothes and then his band. Then they started singing, Blur are Cockney Cockney Cunts. At which point, the fuming guitarist complained to the landlord. The brothers were swiftly ejected and informed they were banned for life from the pub. That same year, Blur released their most successful album to date, Park Life. Four months later, after the release of Park Life, Oasis released their debut album, Definitely Maybe, which became the fastest selling debut album in the UK at that time. Blur and Oasis were on the way up at high speed and everyone was talking about them. Towards the end of 1994, Oasis released a standalone single called Whatever, and they performed it on top of the Pops on the same week that Damon Albarn was hosting it. Next week we have Gary Glare presenting, and then we have a Christmas Day special with those five pretty boys from Manchester. And here are another five pretty boys from Manchester. It's an exclusive, they're Oasis, and they're wonderful. So you can see, Damon introduced them very warmly. However, Round about this time, something happened behind the scenes to create an incredible amount of tension between the two bands. For many, many years, those involved declined to actually say what it was that really started the fallout. And there was that whole nonsense between you and Oasis. I mean, how did that all come about? You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you the real reason why. Right. There are other people involved, and uh, the real reason why we fell out so kind of uh, uh, sort of publicly. 
In his book, Creation Stories, released 10 years after that interview with Damon in 2013, Alan McGee also confirmed there was a secret reason that Liam hated Damon, but he also declined to say what it was. A further six years on, in 2019, Daniel Rachel released a book called Don't Look Back in Anger, The Rise and Fall of Cool Britannia, and in it, Noel Gallagher finally spilled the beans, saying this. Liam and Damon were shagging the same bird, and there was a lot of cocaine involved. That's where the germ of it grew from. There was an NME Awards where we were photographed with Blur, and Liam said, fuck you, you cunts, blah, blah, blah. It just escalated from there. They're both singers, and singers are fucking idiots. They're wired the wrong way round. It's like how gangland wars start over ridiculous things, and then it's very hard to put them to bed. It was kind of like that. According to The Mirror, Alan McGee also confirmed Noel's version of events, saying this. There was a situation with a girl. That created the Britpop war. Damon shagged somebody close to Liam. It was one of many women Damon was friendly with. He got off with her for a one night stand and that created the rub. They were all goading each other after that. Journalists in pretty much all the mainstream UK newspapers got hold of this story following the release of that book and speculated as to the identity of that woman. And all of them seemed to reach the same conclusion. A lady by the name of Lisa Moorish. Here is Liam with her around that time. Liam definitely did have some kind of relationship with her because she is the mother of his daughter, Molly Gallagher. And when Damon was directly asked about whether or not he had a fling with her, he seemed to imply that it was true. This is from an interview with The Guardian in 2003. Presumably, Damon, you won't respond to rumours that the real causes of the great Blur Oasis Farago of 95 was due to the fact that you slept with Liam Gallagher's ex-girlfriend Lisa Moorish behind his back. Damon laughs. What can I say? We were all a lot younger and we were having a good time. That is not an outright denial, is it? In my opinion, that's actually a kind of implicit admission. Liam, however, hotly denied this version of events, tweeting this. Just for the record, me and Dermot Oblong, meaning Damon Albarn, never fell out over a girl or a boy. We always had the crack. I think things turned nasty when Noel Gallagher wished Dermot caught AIDS and died. Not our kid's finest moment. And as for you, McGee, you fucking wasp, keep your fucking mouth shut about me or you'll get slapped. So here Liam is saying it didn't start over a girl, it started because of a very famous comment Noel made saying he hoped two members of Blur would catch AIDS and die. However, those comments weren't actually made historically until many months into the Battle of the Bands. Liam has admitted many times that his memory of those days is often pretty murky and sometimes he can't remember anything, Nebworth being a good example. Noel's comments about AIDS were made at the back end of 1995, long after the bands had already fallen out, so Noel's comments couldn't have started the war. So I think it's fair to say Noel and McGee's version of events is probably right and Liam's memory is probably just a bit murky. Let's move forward now, just one month from that performance on Top of the Pops in December 94 to the Enemy Brat Awards in January of 95. At this point, Noel Gallagher was still on really good terms with Blur. Liam, however, was not. He was absolutely seething. And at the awards event, he was taking out his anger on anyone he could, heckling Elastica, Shed7, and various other bands. I'd like to say uh, thank you very much. And it's a good job Shed7 didn't win it. <laughs> didn't like it. Hey. I'm just got Elastica didn't win it anyway. I'd just like to accept this on behalf of... 
At one point, he heckled James Dean Bradfield from the Manic Street Preachers, who told him to shut the fuck up into a microphone in front of all the world's media, which was quite funny. So very much to Joe and Steve for playing our records, because we only that did last year, so it's very much. Shut the fuck up. The NME Awards 95 were a pretty good snapshot of the British music industry at that time. Blur were right at the top of the pile, with Oasis nipping at their heels. Blur won five awards. Best LP, voted by the readers, Single of the Year, Live Act of the Year, Best Video and Best Band. Oasis won three. Best Single, Best New Band and Album of the Year. After the ceremony itself was over, the winners went backstage for a photo shoot. While there, Liam allegedly started hurling abuse at Blur bassist Alex James, causing guitarist Graham Coxon to wade into the fight in his bandmate's defence. Noel happily posed with Damon afterwards, both holding their awards, but Liam, of course, refused. Liam baited Damon backstage when the duo were asked to pose for a photograph which would have been considered as a cover shot for the NME. Damon readily agreed, but Liam refused, stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Damon and said, I'll tell you to your face, your band's full of shit, right? So I'm not going to do a photo with you. Damon remained commendably cool as Liam again tried to wind him up, saying, you don't honestly want a picture with me, do you? Well, I don't really want one with you. I'm going to have the arse and the balls to say so. But then, with impeccable timing and in front of two NME photographers, Blur guitarist Graham Coxon planted a kiss on the cheek of a stunned Liam Gallagher. And here's the picture of that moment. According to Paolo Hewitt, Noel had a go at Liam for his truculence and called him a pop star. The next week, Noel and Damon graced the cover of the NME. One month later, in February 95, it was time for the Brit Awards, which were yet another clean sweep for Blur. They won four awards that night, blowing everyone else out of the water. A massive achievement which even Oasis at their height never equalled. Oasis won one award that night, British Breakthrough Act. Now it's quite difficult to really be sure with Blur because they spent so much time trying to kind of be ironic. But I kind of get the feeling that these comments from Damon and Graham when they won the last award of the night were actually genuine. Yeah, very good. This should have been, I think this should have been shared with Oasis. Yeah, much love and respect to them. Liam, however, was not pacified whatsoever. Two months later, Oasis released their next single, Some Might Say, on the 24th of April, and it went in at number one. At the after party, Damon showed up, still kind of trying to make nice with Oasis. However, Liam was not willing to forgive nor forget, and so from this point on, Blur decided they'd had enough. This party was the place from which actual band war broke out in earnest. In his book Creation Stories, Alan McGee tells it this way. It was at the party to celebrate being number one when the Blur vs Oasis rivalry first started, and it was all my fault. There'd been a lot of testosterone flying around at the Brits earlier that year when Blur had won Best Band and Oasis had won Best Newcomer. They'd been jeering and shouting at Blur all the way through the ceremony. I'd always liked Damon and Blur. I even went down to the studio when they were making The Great Escape. So, when we threw a big party in Covent Garden to celebrate, I invited them along. Noel and Liam were furious when they heard Blur were coming, but because I was paying for the party, no one could take them off the guest list. To be honest, I knew it would cause trouble. As soon as Damon walked in, Liam strode straight up to him and said, we're number one, you're not, you're not. And there was another reason why Liam hated Damon too, but I can't tell you that. And as we now know, 
That secret reason has since come out, because Damon slept with his girlfriend. This is how the NME reported it. Damon said, When Oasis got to number one with Some Might Say, I went to their celebration party just to say, well done. And Liam came over and he goes, number fucking one, right in my face. So I thought, okay, we'll see. Blur producer Stephen Street said, Liam was really mouthy and arrogant and was even rude about Justine, Damon's girlfriend, at one point. And Damon thought, if you want a battle, we'll give you one. Britpop author John Harris said, Alban had that competitive streak. The common cause had started to fray. I guess Damon decided that Oasis were competition, not allies. And so, at this point, Blur stopped playing nice and decided they had officially had enough, mainly of Liam. Up until now, it had only really been Liam lashing out at Blur. From this point on, however, Blur took the bait and began a full-blown orchestrated campaign to humble Oasis as much as possible. Now, just to put this in context, 1995 was Blur's year. They were the dominant guitar band in the country. Oasis were definitely on the rise in 95, but they were the underdogs to Blur. In Creation Stories, McGee goes so far as to say Blur were four times bigger than Oasis at the time. And so Damon and the Blur camp decided to use their far greater influence and power to bring Oasis down. McGee continues, both bands had singles scheduled for August that would be dead cert number ones. Oasis were due to release Roll With It on the 14th of August, while Blur's Country House was lined up for the 21st of August. But Liam had really got under Damon's skin, so Damon moved the date forward by a week so that it would be a head-to-head -head battle for the top spot. I wasn't surprised when Damon did that. In those days, his ego really was in charge of the band. I suggested to Oasis that they could move their date back a week and was told to shut up immediately. We were quite offended at the time. We were sat in Rockfield and Alan McGee came down and said, well, they've moved their single back. You know, they had it ready to go like two weeks before and they decided to stop it and move it back so it was on the same day as ours. And um, Alan McGee and that was saying, well, you know, just like move yours back again. And we were saying, no, fuck that, you know. So it was a chance, it was their last chance really to drag themselves up on the coattails of my band really. When the NME got hold of the news that there was going to be a chart showdown between the UK's two biggest guitar bands, they immediately hyped it through the roof, termed it the Battle of Britpop, and took a side. Blurs. Take a look at the front cover of their now iconic issue announcing the showdown. Just look at the pictures they chose. Damon looking very photogenic and handsome, and Liam looking like an absolute Muppet. And inside, guess which single they voted single of the week? Of course, it was Blur's Country House. It wasn't long before the chart showdown was all over the British news. Another battle, two of Britain's most popular pop groups have begun the biggest chart war in 30 years. The Manchester band Oasis and their arch rivals Blur released new singles today, each hoping to reach the number one spot next week. The music industry hasn't seen anything like it since the Beatles fought it out with the Rolling Stones in the 60s. When the record shop doors opened this morning, battle commenced. The chances are both singles could have been number one had they been released on separate weeks. I'm a little nervous about the whole thing, um, obviously, because um, both bands have really upped the stakes and uh, someone's going to come out on top and someone's going to come out second. And, you know, by the very nature of being in a band, you're always quite competitive and um, you want to come top, really. The British Heavyweight Pop Music Championship. In one corner, four young middle-class men from the south of England, collectively known as Blur. And in the other corner, five young working-class men from Manchester, called Oasis. Paolo Hewitt picks up the story. The media hype surrounding the release of both the Blur and Oasis singles was building to unmanageable proportions. 
It began in the music press, moved into the tabloids, and ended up as a major news item on ITV's News at 10, the Channel 4 News, and the BBC's 9 o'clock news. Both bands stood stubborn, each side claiming that the other had started it. Noel, on discovering that the Blur single contained the phrase Morning Glory, said, Blur can steal our lines, but it would be impossible for us to do it to them, as I can't think of anything that would go with a bag of shite. To add further insult, Oasis heard Damon Albarn being interviewed by Chris Evans on Radio 1. Evans played the Oasis single to him, and as it ran, Albarn started singing Rocking All Over the World by Status Quo. Noel, at this point, was a bit ruffled, but he still wasn't taking things too seriously. He responded by getting a load of t-shirts made up that said Quoasis on them, and wearing them for videos and interviews. Take a look. The weird thing is, when you go to these European festivals like we've been to this summer, some of the actual... All right, the American bands, forget them, man. It's like, they're crap anyway, you know what I mean? Everybody knows that. But the, some of the European bands, it's like, that. that is surreal music, that, man. As the 14th of August rolled around, it became apparent that Blur had really gone to town. Not only were they already four times bigger than Oasis to start with, but they were releasing two CDs to compete against Oasis's one. Oasis had a very straightforward music video for their single, filmed on location at Top of the Pops. Blur, however, had hired world-class artist Damien Hirst to direct the video for their single. They were pulling out all the stops. And you can see from this quote just how bent on humiliating Oasis Damon really was. This is what he said just before the final charts showdown in August 95. I'm going on holiday, said Damon, and I'm going to leave specific instructions that if I come back on Sunday and we're not number one, then someone is going to suffer some sort of grievous bodily harm. And Blur's very well thought out strategy wasn't the only problem facing the Oasis camp. There was also a technical issue with the barcode on their one single, meaning that many of their CD sales weren't actually being counted. Oasis were almost forced to concede the contest with Blur before it began because of a problem with the printing of the barcode on copies of Roll With It. A spokesman for the distributor said 80 staff worked through the night last Thursday, August the 10th, re-stickering CDs and an annual conference in Bristol was cancelled so they could stick new barcodes on 100,000 copies of the single. And that gives you an idea of just how many singles were affected by this problem. However, on Thursday, August the 17th, staff at one major retail chain told the NME that the Oasis single was still not registering, which means some Oasis sales didn't count towards their eventual chart placing. The band were reported to be furious. Paolo Hewitt tells what was happening behind the scenes with Oasis at the time this way. Noel, who had been on holiday, arrived back in London on Wednesday the 16th, two days after the release of both Blur and Oasis singles. Straight away, he was given some bad news. Creation had let their marketing manager go due to a pay squabble. In the ensuing confusion, thousands of Oasis singles hadn't been given proper barcodes. It spelled disaster and probable defeat. Potentially, thousands of Oasis singles would be bought but never registered. The biggest week in pop history, Noel screamed, and my record company isn't up to it. That night, Noel caught a cab over to the Kensington Hilton and met Paul Weller. They had a few drinks at the bar, and then the two musicians returned to Noel's Camden flat and spent the night getting wasted. So wasted, in fact, that when Oasis manager Marcus arrived at midday to pick Noel up and take him to Top of the Pops, Noel was, in Weller's memorable phrase, frothing at the mouth. At the TV studio, Noel and Liam decided to swap roles. Liam played the guitar, while Noel swayed dangerously by the microphone, singing the song. The BBC only realised, one tabloid reported, because Noel stuck his tongue out 
when he should have been singing. After the show, Noel went home and collapsed. Things were apparently much less fraught behind the scenes in the Blur camp. Andy Ross, head of Food Records, said, I was quietly confident come Sunday. We had access to privileged information. Around that time, we'd play football in Regent's Park. Me, Stephen Street and Damon. We'd go for a kickabout and I was pacing around outside a pub, waiting to meet up with them. I called the relevant number and a matter-of-fact voice said, Blur, number one. So I got a bottle of champagne or something and we went and had a game of football. Damon says, I was on holiday with my parents. It was fine until Thursday night, but by Friday I was getting really agitated and then on Saturday I flew back. Andy Ross rang up and said he was fairly confident. The next day I went to play football and Andy turned up completely pissed. So I knew we'd won, which was brilliant because we needed to upstage park life in some way. And so when the big day rolled around, Oasis went in at number two and Blur went in at number one. But in doing so, they had officially lost the goodwill of Noel Gallagher. Up until this point, Noel had been not taking it all too seriously and trying to restrain Liam. At this point, it all changed because Oasis itself was now under attack and Noel came 100% on side. In front of Noel on his kitchen table as he assimilated all this bad news that Black Wednesday were the music press reviews. Noel tossed away the paper in disgust. He was 60% sure now that Oasis would lose. Then manager Marcus called. Blur had again upped the odds. They had just announced their decision to play in Bournemouth on the same night as Oasis. This was going too far now. Any more of this and fuck the niceties. The media driven rivalry between the two bands almost turned physical later that same year when it was realised that both Blur and Oasis were scheduled to play gigs on the same night at different venues in Bournemouth. Rumours ran rife that coachloads of fans from Manchester, fighting for Oasis, and for some reason Wolverhampton, rucking for Blur, were intent on causing mayhem and no small amount of physical violence upon members of their opposing tribe. When Damon Albarn started boasting that Blur would fly an inflatable number one over the Oasis venue and project their logo onto the building wall, it all became too much for Oasis. Sensing that fans of both groups were liable to get seriously hurt in running street battles, Oasis cancelled their gig. We are not interested in this marketing exercise, said Oasis's head of security. We don't want to play. Drop it. We had no problem with them right up until the point that they started pissing about moving singles back and forward. And then they started booking gigs in the same towns as us when we went on tour and had this big stupid projection of number one was going to project it on our gig. They were playing a pub across the road and we were playing in some fucking gym or something. So we phoned their management and said, look, we're going to pull this gig, right? Because if a lot, if one of your fans gets his head smashed in with a bottle by one of our fans, then, you know... And they'd started this, this ball rolling. So we pulled the gig and they said they were going to do the same. We're going to put out a joint statement. And of course, we pulled the gig they didn't pull their gig, they, they played that night and were sort of, you know, uh, basically gloating at the fact. So that was it then, it was like, right, okay then, right. So we'll see you when in the fucking hospital first with a nervous breakdown, you fucking punts. And that's been it since from then on, I've lost all respect for them and the enemy from that day, really. They sort of took the piss, really. But... And now everybody expects you to say, ah, oh, but it's all in the past and leave it alone. It's like, oh no, I've, no, I haven't finished with him yet. So, Blur were clearly not content to have merely beaten Oasis in the charts. They wanted to keep going afterwards. They were now trying to actively sabotage Oasis gigs, and Noel was officially sick of it. The next interview Noel undertook was with Miranda Sawyer for a major Observer profile of the band. In it, he told her about Blur, the bass player and the singer, saying, I hope the pair of them catch AIDS and die because I fucking hate them too. 
Melody Maker were the first to highlight it. Two days after the Observer appeared, they reported that Noel had brought the whole Blur vs Oasis clash down to new levels of indecency. This was picked up by the rest of the media and the story grew and grew. Of course, sorely provoked, Noel really had overstepped the mark in his anger. I remember it really well. There was a national outcry and Noel ended up having to publicly apologise. The NME reported, in September, Noel Gallagher made his I hope Damon and Alex die of AIDS outburst, which led to recriminations in the press, a full apology from Noel and an agreement to make a donation to AIDS charity, the Terence Higgins Trust. Noel released a statement saying, as soon as I had said it, I realised that it was an insensitive thing to say, as AIDS is no joking matter, and I immediately retracted the comment. Although not being a fan of their music, I wish both Damon and Alex a long and healthy life. Oasis's lowest moment in the Battle of Britpop had arrived. They'd been beaten by Blur at the NME Awards in January, beaten by Blur at the Brit Awards in February, beaten by Blur in the Battle of Britpop in August, and then in September, Noel, having lashed out, had to apologise with his tail between his legs. But the tables were about to turn so suddenly and aggressively that no one could have predicted what was to come next. Because on the 2nd of October, one month later, Oasis released What's the Story Morning Glory, which sold 345,000 copies in its first week of release in the UK alone and spent a full 10 weeks at number one in the UK album charts. Blur may have won the singles chart battle, but they decisively lost the oncoming war. Their subsequent album, The Great Escape, did solid enough business on the UK charts, but was eclipsed entirely by the staggering sales of Oasis's sophomore effort, What's the Story Morning Glory, which became the fastest selling album in the UK since Michael Jackson's Bad a decade before. To date, it has sold close to 5 million copies worldwide. The next month, in November 95, Liam and Damon seemingly buried the hatchet a little bit at the MTV Music Awards in Paris. The enemy journalist asked Damon, do you regret the whole Blur, Oasis, Ego, Wank contest? Damon responded, I have regretted it now and again, but I don't anymore. To be honest, I think it did them more good than us. It brought them into the main arena where they hadn't really been before. But fair enough, they deserve it. I sort of made up with Liam at the MTV Music Awards in Paris the other week. He was sitting at a table near us. He looked like a jester, with hair flapping over his ears. Later on, he came to our dressing room and said, sorry for what our kids said. It was out of order, he's a twat. Then he said, I still think your album's shit though. And we laughed and said, yours is too. I like Liam though. He's a good laugh, amusing company. He just gets a bit out of hand sometimes. Noel, however, was still furious and his hatred towards Blur was far from over. As 1995 drew to a close, so did Blur's Year in the Sun. And as 1996 dawned, it was time for the absolute domination of Oasis. And the band, who had been so decisively humiliated by Blur the year before, were about to get their own back. The NME and the British music press in general, being the utterly mercenary bastards that they are, saw that public opinion was changing in favour of Oasis and promptly switched sides. And at the next NME Awards in January 96, this time Oasis won five awards. They won Best Live Act, Best Band, Best LP, Best Single, Liam won Most Desirable Human Being, and Blur only got one award, Git of the Year, which went to Damon Albarn. And one month later came probably the most significant and important awards show of the Britpop years, the Brit Awards 96 on the 19th of February. There too, where Blur had triumphed in 95, Oasis swept the board in 96. 
They won British Album of the Year, British Video of the Year and Best British Group. Blur won nothing. And when Oasis won their first award of the night, they made a point of publicly celebrating how much the tables had turned, singing a slightly altered version of the Blur hit Park Life. I'd like to thank um, all the people. All oh, oh, people. people. So many people. And they walk your county towns. And it has through their shite life. Three months later, Oasis and Blur squared up to one another once again, but this time at a charity football match at Mile End on the 15th of May, 96. But anything between Liam and Damon really at this point was only for show, because they had already made up behind the scenes. And neither band football team actually won, both Blur and Oasis lost in the end to Reef, who ended up winning what was called the Britpop Derby. 1996 continued and Oasis got bigger and bigger and bigger, while Blur slipped further out of the limelight. And Damon had seemingly come to really resent Noel in this time. Blur toured America several weeks before Oasis were due to do the same, and Noel said this about what Damon did on that tour. In America, everywhere I went, Damon had been there three weeks before. He was going on about being working class, and Damon said I'd bought this Rolls Royce and that I'd drive around London waving to all the poor people. People have seen through him now. People know he's a cunt and he's a knobhead. He's had his day. How come every time I pick up a newspaper and we're in it, we're talking about us, but with him, it's about how much of a cunt I am. I went to Cannes Film Festival, right? And he was there. When I got back, he said I had followed him around everywhere. Like I've got fuck all better to do than follow you around with your fucking ugly bird. Things deteriorated even further for Blur and Damon began getting abuse in the streets as Oasis rose ever higher and things continued to get even further out of hand. Because you were saying to me last time we met that, you know, when you were, you know, just walking around in the street, you were getting heckled. Yeah. But also cheered as well. I don't think it's kind of, I don't want to cast myself as like, you know, you know, poor little Damon, everyone started picking on him. It's, it wasn't really like that, but it, it was quite a bit unnerving on occasions. I mean, I, everywhere I went, I'd be reminded of it. Good evening, Top of the Pops, best band in the world, live and exclusive. It's not Blur. It's a Vegas, but it's I'm free. On the 10th and 11th of August 96, Oasis played two nights at Nebworth House to a quarter of a million people. Over 2.5 million had applied for tickets, and it remains to this day the largest ever demand for concert tickets in British history. Blur may have won the first skirmish, but in the long term, Oasis were the decisive victors in the war. As 96 rolled into 97, and Oasis became the biggest band in the world, with the exception of America, Damon was beginning to sound seriously bitter in interviews. In January 97, the NME reports, we are discussing the new Blur single, Beetlebum, and its writer is happily admitting that it is very reminiscent of a certain popular 60s combo, saying, I thought the most unfashionable thing for us to come back with was a song that sounded like the Beatles. I want Noel to listen to Beetlebum and realise that it's closer, he seethes. There's still no love lost between us. He wished I'd died of AIDS, and he can go fuck himself, basically. It's not a musical thing or anything, but as a person, he did something. I don't care if he apologised for it. He never apologised to me for it. The journalist asked, do you think he ever will? And Damon replied, no, and I don't want him to. The journalist said, let's face it, 
He's really going to want to twat you now, isn't he? Damon laughs. He can try. I've got to keep the ante up a little bit, haven't I? I can't turn into a complete fucking hippie. I've been pretty nice, but I haven't had a lobotomy. I haven't had my balls cut off. And yet, interestingly, the release of that single, Beetlebum, might have sowed the very first seeds of healing between Noel and Damon, because Noel heard the single and secretly absolutely loved it. He later said this to Q magazine. Beetlebum is probably my favourite song of Damon's. When I heard it for the first time, I did think, shit, I wish I'd written that. And it turns out Noel wasn't the only member of Oasis taken aback with the quality of the new Blur single either. Because when asked in 2017 what his favourite Blur song was, Liam replied this, Beetlebum. In 1999, Blur released another song called Tender, which apparently also hugely impressed Noel. Time passed, however, the 90s ended, and by the year 2000, the Britpop movement was well and truly over. In 2003, Noel still hated Damon. Well, that just goes to show what a pompous arse he is. He's such a condescending cock, isn't he, you know? Oh, fuck, I wrote this album so I could stop American culture coming to Britain. Fucking wanker. He knows nothing. He's from Colchester. He's a fucking student. He took A-level music. You know, he knows nothing. You see, the thing about Damon Alburn is, is he's so defensive, and no matter what, no matter what accusation you level at him, you know, he'll have to defend himself. He'd be sat there watching this now going, I'm not like that, I'm not like that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I fucking swear, I'm not. You know, and it's like, you fucking started it, mate, you know what I mean? It would be eight years later, on the 15th of October 2011, that Noel and Damon bumped into each other in a club in London, and this happened. Years later, we happened to pass each other in the corridor. And we kind of went, oh, no way. And then we went to the bar and got a drink. And the first thing we spoke about was how great all that was. You know, we never mentioned the insults and, and all that kind of thing. Still haven't. And from that point on, Noel and Damon became and remained friends. And 10 years after slamming him in the Live Forever documentary, in 2013, at a concert for the Teenage Cancer Trust, the previously unthinkable happened. Noel actually joined Damon on stage to perform one of the Blur songs he loved, Tender. And since then, Noel and Damon have worked together several times and are now apparently quite close. Noel loves spending time with Damon even when they're not working. He said, I love working and hanging out with that mob, not just Damon, but all his people. It turned out we had a lot of mutual friends and they're all cool as fuck. The Gorillas shows at the O2 recently were two mega nights out. Damon too has high praise for Oasis in hindsight. Our editor would like to know who you think was better, you lot or Oasis? I think Oasis were better. Do you? Yeah, you I think don't. They, I do. However, Liam, of course, despite also actually being mates with Damon, got in the last word, saying this. Being a lad is what I'm about, but I'll tell you who isn't a lad, anyone from Blur. <laughs>